All right, this is going to be the learning environment. And topics we're going to discuss here is the welcoming, some housekeeping, setting expectations, uh, the physical environment, the psychological environment, encouraging teamwork, special considerations, and special student considerations. Now, a little introduction here. Uh, pretty much being an educator involves uh, much more than simply imparting knowledge and anecdotes to your students. An effective educator is responsible for ensuring student success by providing an appropriate learning environment. A uh, positive learning environment is one that allows a free exchange of ideas and information, uh, one which the student feels safe asking a question and the educator uh, acquires the necessary tools to answer those questions. Uh, Abraham Maslow's theory regarding human motivation and development in the hierarchy of deeds in 1943 is where we kind of get this from. Now, what Abraham Maslow was, was the father of modern leadership. So he theorized that pretty much that everyone had uh, a hierarchy, so to speak. And the closer that you attained the top of this pyramid, which is in the first model, was self-actualization. Pretty much, you know, physiological needs and then self-esteem issues. And then as this grew, you had more and more tools to become self-actualized or autonomous. Now, we need to try to set up an environment, and this is what this slide says about, of, of creating a learning environment and creating the most positive learning environment that we possibly can. And let's go to the next slide. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is the welcome. Um, a student's introduction to the learning environment can take place, can make a lasting impression, uh, greatly affecting the, the learning that takes place thereafter. So first impressions are essential. Culture develops and it gives meaning to the learning process that occurs in the class. So the educator to, needs to give special attention to the first day of class to ensure a positive learning experience can occur. Something as simple as learning the names of your students or helping them learn each other's names can break the ice or create a positive environment. I like to get them to talking. So anything that you can do to interact and start to build a rapport the first day of class is essential. So the welcome is very important. First impressions are lasting ones. Housekeeping. A fundamental part of creating a comfortable learning and teaching environment is assurance that the basic needs of both the student and the educator are met. So very simply, if let everyone know where the restrooms are, where the refreshments can be found, and provide adequate breaks. An adult needs a break about every hour. They can't just take it on the nose continuously. So as you are breaking this areas up about every hour give them a little bit of a break so that they can go to the bathroom get some coffee if necessary uh, and that way that they can stay alert and take notes during your class periods. Uh, setting expectations we're going to talk about two things the syllabus and accountability uh, in this section uh, students in their classroom from a variety of cultures and backgrounds uh, They have a variety of preconceptions of learning, so they have an idea of what they think learning's about already. The educator should realize uh, this and implement uh, the standard of expected behavior and achievement. And to do that, we need to make the student accountable. And a good way of doing that is to put together a student handbook or have a student handbook for them or a syllabus. And we're going to talk about those. Um, you need to give them autonomy or give them the ability to become autonomous as soon as possible. They're adults. Treat them like adults. Remember, this isn't pedagogy. This is andragogy. Uh, the syllabus defines the rules of engagement for the course. So the first thing we talk about here, the syllabus or the student handbook represents a learning contract between the instructor and the student. The contract outlines the expectations for the course and the evaluation of the course uh, work. So what the course is going to cover, what kind of tests you can expect in this, and how you're going to be assessed on your uh, knowledge base. Uh, the document protects the students and the educator. It provides a consistent place where students can overview expectations of the course. So if it's in writing, you have a letter of acknowledgement, which is a good thing as well. At the end of your syllabus, I understand everything that I've read and I agree to it and have them sign it. 
Um, very simply, what that does is that's kind of a binding contract between you and the student at that point. Accountability. The educator plays a role of the recognized leader in the classroom. As a leader, he or she is responsible for setting and enforcing the norms of conduct. The educator is also the role model for those norms of conduct. So, uh, on, on this note, as far as accountability, you are accountable to the student. In that accountability, you should lead by example. Uh, students enroll in the class have the right to expect a safe environment and appropriate behavior on the part of fellow classmates. This also includes professional educators in the classroom, lab, or clinical settings. Make every learning experience a positive one for your students. The physical environment. We're in this section we're going to talk about room temperature, lighting, distractions, physical safety, seating arrangements, some extra considerations, and then some audiovisual equipment. Room temperature. Uh, temperature is important. Temperature in the classroom should be at a comfortable setting for the task at hand. An example, heat turned down on skills day because everyone's going to get hot. We don't want them all sweating. Uh, advises students that they may wish to bring a sweater if it's going to be cool and they're standing around. I'll assure you if they're doing skills, they'll warm up pretty quickly. Lighting. Lighting should be adjusted so that it can be dimness to make sure the best of the audio visuals but light enough to demonstrate any notes taking so whenever you have audio visuals up on the board sometimes if you have bright light the lumen of the actual projector um, kinda gets in the way so it, the lights need to be dim enough or be able to be dimmed so that you can actually see what you're talking about but then again enough light should be present so that if they need to take notes they can uh, distractions. Distractions such as noise, bright sunlight, interruptions can affect the learning environment. An educator should ask the student to shut off pagers and cell phones or turn them on vibrate and answer emergency calls only. Everything that can be done to minimize distractions will improve the learning environment. If a person is being texted or they're letting Facebook again and again and again um, kind of interrupt the class session, that's kind of inappropriate. If it's their babysitter because their child is sick, need to have some flexibility on those same rules. Uh, if you need to make an emergency call, please step out so that you don't disrupt the rest of the student's learning experience. Just make some nice rules of engagement in your syllabus um, whenever the course starts. Physical safety. Uh, rules for class safety should be stated by the educator and listed in the course syllabus. Um, this is kind of like an overall safety briefing for the overall for the whole course, uh, for or at least for that section. Students should exhibit appropriate behavior around specialized equipment. And examples of this: balloon pumps, ventilators, IV skills, universal precautions as necessary. <clears throat> even whenever we're playing in the lab with even uh, essentially Kool-Aid water or dyed water, <clears throat> we would want to have universal precautions. If you get the stains or get that stuff to stain in, on your clothes, it's hard to get out. So we don't want them ruining their clothes, ruining shirts and p pants and purses and and, um, and jackets while they're trying to get in there and get some psychomotor skills. Seating arrangements. An educator should be able to configure and reconfigure a classroom in a variety of ways and will assist with the instructional strategy for that session. <clears throat> Examples of this, eight-hour sessions, pretty much you should have some padded seats. A seating arrangement that will focus also on the instruction. And we're going to take a look at some seating arrangements here. Um, there's various ones the books talks about. There's traditional, and I'm going to kind of mark some of these, uh, traditional theater. There is a rectangular open, which is this one here, and a rectangular closed and then there is a round table this one is good if you're having debates and then this one up here the round table up here is good if you are actually having them working in small groups so uh, talk about each one of these here for just a second a little bit traditional so traditional setup classroom is ideal for a large number of students um, this is not a good setup for a small group so if you only had three or four students you would not want to actually use this traditional seating. Uh, it may allow students to hide behind others if you have uh, a large group as well in this. This guy on the back row here could definitely kind of 
be hidden away from the view of the instructor. Uh, theater seating, theater seating. If you have a very large group, in this is a good idea. It's an easy way to get lots of students in. <clears throat> you can actually do demonstrations, lectures, and all kinds of cool stuff in theater seating. And most, and the students can see because each row, generally in theater seating, is higher than the one previous. Uh, rectangular open, U-shaped uh, educator in the center, and that's this one here that we're talking about. Now, the uh, rectangular open, uh, excellent when students are expected to participate in discussion, works well for psychomotor demonstration, you can put something in the middle, uh, does not work well for lecture scenario, a student will sit with his back to the instructor. So very simply you have to have interaction if you're going to set up and adjust your classroom seating. Uh, rectangular closed which is this one here. These are some different ideas that the book has. Uh, ideal setup for large discussion groups not recommended for lectures or presentations. Uh, focus may not be on the educator. It's hard to be sure that you are uh, interacting and getting feedback from your students that they're understanding what what you're actually saying. Uh, rectangular, or I'm sorry, round table was the next one. And there's two different round tables here. There's a big round table, uh, arranged around different workstation or round tables. Focus on the, on the instruction is within the table or group. It's important that this style, that the educator move around the room. And in this one here, this one would be good open for discussion. I'm talking about the big round table here. Um, the instructor probably needs to educate from the center as much as possible. In this, if you're having them work on specific projects, this would be a good thing uh, to break up the projects and see how they did. Uh, another good way is if you have varying types of students in your actual classroom as well. You have natural born leaders and people that kind of are introverted. Uh, readjust and mix them up and put them in different various groups. Uh, and change those groups. It, it, the changing of the groups from one group to another, like say that this student here, this was group A, and he was he was there that day. So you did this again, and he was in, this is group B, C, D, and so on. So you moved him over and changed the dynamic so that he got kind of a flavor for another way of leadership. Uh, in every group you're going to have people kind of scurrying to become the leader of that group, especially if they're focused on the task at hand. Um, let's clear this off. So extra considerations and the, pretty, the educator should be able to easily answer the following questions. Is the room adequate size? Is there space to sit and take notes? Can each student see the instructor? Is the lighting adequate? Are the environmental controls okay? Is there an area for breaks? Will the classroom accommodate physical disabilities? Are restrooms and emergency exits marked and easily located? Can distractions from outside be minimized? How good is the lighting and security in the parking lot? Now, all of those, if you can answer all of those questions, and they're all good answers and positive ones and things that would reinforce, hey, I got a great education environment, then that pretty much would summarize uh, the setting up of your classroom. Uh, audio-visual equipment. Educator must ensure that audio-visual equipment is in working order and that a backup plan is available. So if you actually do have audio-visual problems, you can very quickly implement a backup plan. So maybe have one in the actual department that can easily be plugged in and you can kind of go from there or have IT available to where you can call them and have them fix the problem or switch to another classroom if possible. Um, Audiovisual equipment and technology will be covered more in chapter 16. Uh, the psychological environment. We should ensure that there's mutual respect and that there's some shared responsibility of the classroom. We'll talk about all these. Safety, uh, intellectual challenge, and then conflict. So let's talk about mutual respect first. You as an instructor or an educator should strive to establish adult to adult rapport with the students. Very simply, the better rapport that you have with your students, the easier it is for you to tailor the actual education that they are receiving. The better that you make a quick assessment of what type of learner that they are, 
how well they're getting along, if they have a positive attitude. A positive attitude goes a long way. Um, and it's easy if you do some activities or just talk to your students in the first few days that you can gain some mutual respect from them. You have a little bit of street credit already just because you're the instructor. Shared responsibility. <clears throat> An environment should be created where students share responsibility for their own learning. Uh, students value a supportive environment in which the student perceives the educator is making sincere efforts to assist them. So be sure whenever you try to help them that it's sincere. Um, if, if you're assisting them with something or trying to explain something to them, be sincere about it. Don't, don't get a negative attitude is what I'm trying to say. Uh, Student-centered learning activities are a good way of implementing this. So we take it back on the student. We actually build some learning activities to where they have a little bit of control in this and this gives them more autonomy which makes them feel better about their overall learning experience. Safety. Creating a safe environment that students can learn in without the fear of ridicu ridicule is essential ways to achieve this. Uh, students are free of harm and sexual discrimination. Students are free from teasing. Students and educators exhibit tolerance. Both students and educators encourage new ideas. The more that we can encourage new ideas to where there's no repercussion whatsoever, the only dumb question is the one that's not asked. The closer that we can get to that, uh, the better learning environment I think that we can actually build. Intellectual challenge. Uh, research shows that there's an increased interest in learning and stimulation when the students are challenged to learn and think and react just above their current threshold. So if they thought that they were here, if they thought that their threshold, this is my learning limit, and we try to get them to about this level here, just a little more, then they will actually have an increased interest in actual learning and expectations this can be expectations from the instructor this can be a reinforcement hey you all are doing an awesome job one of the least utilized things that we can actually do as an educator is tell them that they did a good job conflict Conflict is kind of a reality. You're going to have conflict in every aspect of education. Someone's going to have an issue with it. It just rubs them wrong. It feels to them like you're trying to change their religion when you're actually not. Show them the science. Um, identify the actual conflict or the problem. We'll talk about this a little bit more. Let's, let's get through the overalls of this. Uh, you should not be afraid of conflict. Realize that there's an opportunity to manage the situation. A good educator should learn how to manage conflict. And in managing conflict, uh, the steps in the classroom, there are three of them. And this is clarify. Step one is to clarify the situation. And step two in this is a workable solution. and then apply the solution. Sounds pretty simple at this point, don't it? Um, again, and we try to give them as much autonomy as possible. So let's talk about step one there. One, we want to clarify the problem. Uh, ask questions to clarify the problem at hand. The step identifies students and clarifies the issue at hand. So if the students have a problem, step up. Speak now or forever hold your peace. Whenever they come up with a problem, identify. Say, okay, that's a problem. Do we have a workable solution for that? Have them get into groups if you have to, or have the students offer suggestions for the solution. All parties should work together with a positive attitudes and identify ground rules for the solution. This is what I can allow at the college level. Or this is what I can allow for, as the instructor. Come up with a solution come up with some solutions that we can work with and then once they have decided on this solution apply the solution and now this is the changed version 2.0 this is what we're going to do from this point forward have the students work together to develop a plan of action and ensure the completion of the solution uh, areas come up all the all the time uh, the clinicals may not be working with their 
with their work schedules. Um, I can't get into the open labs. So try to open up those discussions and give them a little bit of responsibility. If they are going to gripe about it, just make us I make a simple ground rule in my classes. I don't care if you gripe, but if you're going to gripe and pose a problem, don't pose any problem that you don't have at least two solutions to work with work with. And let's clear this off. The social environment. The learning environment is dynamic. As your class gets to know one another, the group dynamic may change, and this is as they develop rapport within one another and with you, the overall social environment of the class may change quite rapidly too. Encouraging teamwork. Teamwork skills are essential. Uh, group projects are a good way to teach teamwork, and there are three stages to good group dynamics. There's a forming stage, a storming stage, and a performing stage. The forming stage uh, encounter one another for the first time, the students do, and the theme of this stage is to, buy, to pretty much define the task that has been given them. So you're going to see at this point who your actual leaders are, and then here in the storming stage, jockeying for position by team members as they struggle, struggle to define team leadership. So whether they want to do this or not, they are going to provide a leader. Now you can't have a leader each, each, let's say you had three leaders in a small group and each leader is wanting to do a different thing. There's going to have to be someone that stands up saying, okay, I understand your position. Do you understand mine? And there has to be some compromise or some resolution of this. And then a performing stage. During this stage, the team balances any kind of interpersonal conflicts that they have or relationships with the other portions of the team and they need to identify and get the results done. And this is where we start to see the actual work forming uh, in the performing stage. So forming stage, let me see what I, what I have to do here. The storming stage, jockeying for leadership positions, and then the performance stage, whenever they actually have a plan in motion and they're starting to create their own inertia. Special considerations, the laboratory and clinical environment, non-traditional environments, and the use of new technologies. Laboratory and clinical environments. The clinical environment is an important part of EMS education. When setting up the skills, the following things should be considered. Is it safe? You cannot have um, a chainsaw with a chain, you know, like a, a psychotic killer in the middle of the room with a chainsaw gang, 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 and revving it up. There has to be some kind of safety rules and safety briefing for each type of lab that you actually do. Uh, visibility. Everyone needs to be able to see what's actually going on. Our rehearsal, uh, so that all things that you are trying to demonstrate are done appropriately. That way you don't reinforce or create a bad habit. Uh, practice size, there needs to be adequate amounts of practice and um, a large enough group of instructors to assist with the practice size. Encourage self-learning. Uh, one of the best things that you can get a student to do is to assess themselves. So at the lower levels of your skill sheets whenever you're just trying to create knowledge or maybe application instead of mastery as far as the actual psychomotor skills. A good thing to do is to get them to assess themselves but they still have to have a coach for that assessment. Uh, stimulate real environments or simulate real environments. Oh, I apologize. Simulate real environments. So the more realistic that the environment is the more that it actually gets them there to the scene that they'll run in the future, the easier learning will be, the better the buy-in will be from your students. And then appropriate Jess, if you're requiring actual uniforms so that they're nice and comfortable with going to their scissors or going to their stethoscope or knowing where their parts and tools will be, then that's going to be more appropriate for that laboratory or clinical environment non-traditional environments. Uh, typical learning environments include classroom, laboratory, hospital settings, or the field. As the settings become more complex, they integrate higher levels of thinking and psychomotor skills. Adding complexity may elevate critical thinking. Simplifying the environment may remove complications and restore student confidence. So as far as this goes, very simple concept on this, if you have added complexity to the environment, you will get a higher level of critical thinking from the student at this level. However, if you're finding somebody that is having difficulty 
in implementing those skills and they need to have some more confidence reinforced maybe reducing some of those complexities to where it increases their self-confidence would be a better approach now here's the rub on this understanding your students levels and understanding where your students are at is essential in doing this Uh, use of new technologies. Internet, computer-based teaching, satellite education are technologies that can be used to enhance the learning environment. Other areas and things like online libraries or databases, games like Jeopardy that you can get student groups to working with are good ways to trick them into education so to speak. Um, they're fun, easy way to use terms, easy way to use topics, um, Jeopardy games are very easily set up in PowerPoint and then the instructor would play Alex Trebek so to speak. Uh, special student issues so these are all different types of students that you may actually see in your class and some ways to correct them so very simple ways to kinda correct their their azimuth or their point or direction if you will. Uh, the latecomer. The student's the one that regularly comes late to class. Uh, ways to, to kind of correct this activity on your student's part. Start the class with a quiz or an assignment. Uh, take the student aside and counsel them. Say, hey, kind of, you can't be showing up every day late. Um, is there something that I can do? And I can't start the class an hour later. Is there a reason that you're like this? Try to see if you can help as much as you can, but keep firm to the standard. Uh, have the student put together a corrective action plan and this would be in their own writing and sign it uh, if it comes to the counseling part. So if you're counseling any student ha always have them make a corrective action plan or a cap and have them write it out in their own handwriting. So this is what I need you to do. We're going to consider this just a verbal counseling at this point but I need you to come up with a corrective action plan and send it to me how are you going to correct your actions? That way they can kind of reflect over it and kind of get it in their head and say okay either I can do this or I can't. Um, if I think that I still can do this then I need to correct my actions. The bored one. This student is the one that appears to be bored either by body language or lack of participation. Uh, ways to correct this. Create an opportunity for the student to participate. Actively engaging students make them a stakeholder. So whenever they start interacting in groups with other students, they actually have an inter a more of an interest in the class. Uh, they've kind of bought in, so to speak. Uh, visit with the student to identify the underlying issue if there is one. See if you can correct. Am I just and you can't just come out and say, "Am I just boring you to death?" But uh, just tell him that you know his body language or his lack of participation is concerning. Everything that we actually perform in EMS has a lab function at some point to where they need to show psychomotor mastery. The social butterfly. This is a student that spends more time visiting with everyone as opposed to learning. So they're very interactive, they're very social, uh, ways to correct this may require a job assignment in the class that will put his or her people skills to work. A brief discussion on focusing on the effects of their behavior uh, may also point them in the right direction as well. If it becomes a problem and you have to do a full-blown counseling again, make a corrective action plan and have them sign this out in their own on their own words. Uh, the introvert, a student remains distant, avoids discussion, uh, more like a tourist than an active participant. Uh, ways to correct this, they need to become more involved in the learning process. Have a student lead a small group discussion, so have them actually lead a small group discussion. Encourage these students to take more chances. If they start taking small risks, and they'll lead eventually to bigger risks, and they'll become more involved. I just need to get them opened up a little bit. A way to shine, if you will. Uh, the domineering one. The student will dominate class situations and lab settings if allowed to do so. Um, ways to correct. Small groups with other students serving as a leader. Assign a project. Have the student research and report to the class during the next meeting. Uh, if behavior is consistently disruptive, confront the student and explain how the student can participate positively. If it comes to counseling, again, make a corrective action plan. 
have them sign it or write it out in their own words. Uh, the sleeper. EMS students that work a day job, in addition to taking classes, this lifestyle can be exhausting. Uh, I call it breaking their necks because you'll see them start nodding, especially if they haven't had a, lot of, uh, a, a good amount of sleep or the correct amount of sleep. Uh, ways to correct, calling the student to answer questions, kind of puts them on the spot and doesn't create an exactly a positive um, education environment, but you can call them out. It will correct the action pretty quickly. Uh, ensure that the students have a break about every hour. Allow them to bring coffee or drink coffee. Give them enough time to drink a little coffee or get some caffeine on board. Uh, involve students in learning activities other than traditional lecture. Lecture format most of the time can be boring unless you're very interactive with your group of students. Uh, the confused one. The student has problems grasping the material. They may exhibit this by engaging the material or having a tremendous amount of questions. Just kind of lost. Ways to correct this. The student should provide the student with clear expectations and a detailed plan on how to accomplish this. Project groups can reinforce the theory uh, and then tutoring can also be arranged is a good way if they're just absolutely lost. Uh, the hostage. Any agency or company that require their employees to attend a mandatory EMS certification, the students may strike a defiant pose. Why do we have to be here? Why are you making us come here? Very simply on this, try to get their buy-in on it. Say, hey, I'm here with you. I'm the one that's trying to, to teach you in this. If you interact with me, I promise it won't be that bad. If, I can, if you can get them to buy in on their education just a little bit, then very simple, or give them some autonomy so that they don't feel like they're children again, it will expand them greatly. And, and they'll probably open up to you and you'll get a good rapport with them quite quickly. Again, first impressions are essential. So, summary here really quick. The environment in which student is learning is important. Effective educators make every effort to create an environment that's physically, psychologically, and socially safe. Your tactics that you develop may change with each class. Every time that you have a new class, due to the interaction and its own social element, you're going to have to customize your tactics with that class. Be sure that you have plenty in your bag of tricks. If you have any questions concerning this, feel free to give me a call. My name is Roy Smith. You can be reached at smithr at imsa.net or 405-219-7613. Thank you.